You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by NASDAQ. From its inception, NASDAQ has been an innovator and agent of change in the financial markets. It's in our DNA. From the development of electronic trading to our drive to bring enhanced functionality and world-leading technology to our suite of six options exchanges, we exemplify customer focus, consistent technology, and streamlined solutions. Now NASDAQ is proud to launch the NASDAQ 100 Volatility Index, ticker symbol VOLQ, to its suite of exchange indexes. VOLQ uses only at-the-money options to provide a precise measure of NASDAQ 100 volatility. Learn more about this exciting new volatility product at www.nasdaq.com VOLQ. NASDAQ, leading the U.S. options market and continually rewriting tomorrow. And now, it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again. It is Friday. It is noon central. It is 1 p.m. Eastern. It is time for the final, at least on demand show. For all you pro folks, you got another show coming at you after this, but our final podcast for all you on-demand folks here on the week. Yes, it is time for Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. My name, of course, Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as from the ever-engaging, ever-insightful, dare I say it, Options Insider Radio Network, reminding you just three things here at the top of the show. First off, if you like what you hear, do keep rating and reviewing on your platform of choice. If you're just listening to Vol Views, I know there are a handful of you out there that do just like the Vol Views, what are you doing? You have to listen to the full network out there at the end of the day. You're missing out on nearly a dozen other shows that will keep you engaged, informed, perhaps even entertained. Who knows? <laughs> Throughout the week, covering all aspects of options, from futures options to crypto to asset managers and how they should use them, as well as, of course, a smattering of Vol and everything else there under the sun. And then if you want even more in your lives, you don't want your broadcast week to end with volatility views at the end of the weekend. Who can blame you? It's a fun party. You want to keep it going. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go to keep that partay alive. This is the final day to get your name in the hat for the March Pro Trading Crate. We will give it away beginning of next week for one lucky member on the pro side. If you enter on the pro, you're automatically entered to win. Don't have to do anything else. Fun prizes. Follow our Twitter if you want to see what people are tweeting out, all the fun stuff that they win, which drives the Rock Lobster crazy to no end. He really is jealous of you folks winning those boxes, which makes it even more fun for us to send those out to you. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go to learn more as we go to learn who's joining us on the old Volatility Views program today. First, let's go out to the quiet, tranquil hamlet known as Austin, soon to be the home of the upcoming RMC for this year. So turning into a little volatility mecca down there where we are joined once again. By the greasiest of meatballs, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. Mr. Meatball, welcome back to the show. How did your baked good extravaganza go last week, sir? 
Oh, my, uh, my armadillo. You would have, you would have thought it was a real live armadillo. It was so good. That, you made a red velvet armadillo. <laughs> I made a red velvet armadillo. <laughs> You, you're quite the Texan now, aren't you? Baking armadillo cakes. Oh, yeah. I baked an armadillo, baked the lasagna. It was, uh, it was fun for all. And, uh, and a, 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 a gee golly good time. I had no idea you had such culinary skills, sir, in the baking department. Interesting. Oh, yeah. No, I make a mean lasagna. Uh, and I definitely, uh, this is my second attempt at uh, making a uh, designer cake. Uh, and, and in both, both scenarios. The, it, the cake was fine. It did not look like its intended target, though. At all. <laughs> the artistic level probably uh, requires a little bit more work. But you're saying you know your way around an oven. Interesting. Interesting stuff. They're always full of surprises over there in Meatball Land. As we turn now back to the NASDAQ hot seat where we are joined once again, the streak continues. Mr. Kevin Dabbitt, the head of NASDAQ Index Options. Kevin, welcome back to the show. Congratulations on keeping the streak alive for another week, sir. Man, I'm getting really comfortable in this seat. I'm enjoying it. Uh, I'm disappointed that I'm perhaps not quite the renaissance man that the meatball is, but I, I can sharpen my, my kitchen skills in the coming weeks. <laughs> we'll see. we got more baked goods debate to come as we keep right. on rolling right on into the volatility review. It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the Volatility Review. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Volatility Review, the portion of the show where we do just that. We break down the week that was and indeed still is about trading and trending and analysis. All sorts of fun perspectives. And as we're kicking off the final session of the week here, listeners, seems like all is right in the world. Some numbers may be showing inflation, maybe, maybe backing off a little bit, which is always a good thing. At the end of the day, it all comes back around to inflation and thus the Fed, right? So those numbers are helpful. You would never know, but looking at the market last couple of sessions that were still debating this whole contagion thing, <laughs> Schwab getting downgraded recently. Uh, people saying the large numbers of banks are still technically insolvent, all sorts of debate going on on this contagion issue. Yet you look at the markets, you would never really see that. It's just a rally ho across the board yet again today, up nearly a full percent, about 0.9 percent out there in the S&P. So not quite at about 4,100, but we are threatening it. So maybe we'll even be there by the end of the show. You never know these days, listeners. So looking Pretty robust out there. Dow up about 0.8% as well. So similar pacing to the S&P. And the NASDAQ, once again, leading the charge up about 1.15%. That means all of our vol friends are coming crashing down from this time last week, listeners. Just a vol apocalypse across the board. Uh, VIX Cash, when we kicked off the show, sub-19 handles at an 1860, listeners. That puts it down over four, about 4.4 points from where it was this time last week. So... Quite the vol drubbing of uh, VVIX 84. So this one has plummeted as well, down 21 points from this time last week. And it was down 17 points already last week. So they have really come for vol and vol of vol over the last couple of weeks. Vol Q 21 and three quarters. That's down exactly three points from where it was this time last week. So a lot to unpack out there. Let's go around the horn uh, the opposite of the way we started. Let's go out to the NASDAQ hot seat first. Mr. Kevin, what is catching your eye out there in pretty much a, a vol apocalypse right now? That That is a fair way to characterize what we've seen. Certainly, if you go back two weeks when we were talking about contagion and genuine bank fears, it's amazing how capital markets can reprice risk. We have seen that play out in spades over the past two weeks and per particularly this week. Whether it continues remain, remains to be seen. We are obviously at the last day of Q1. I will uh, make mention of the fact that it's been a very, very good quarter for the NASDAQ 100. And whether you realize it or not, the NASDAQ 100 is in a new bull market up uh, just over 22% in the past three months. There we go. Bull market territory yet again. So listeners, all sorts of madness abounds. Should be a fun show here 
the day. Let's go back now to that volatility mecca. Before we get into the vol, we were talking about your culinary skills, Mr. Meatball. And our live chat has questions. Uh, Option God and Options Queen are both asking, since your name is the Greasy Meatball, do you make a mean meatball? Oh, yeah, I do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. I got a killer recipe for meatballs. Well, there you go. Living up uh, to your namesake. Our chat will be happy. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be, uh, I, I, it's a family recipe, but I've improved on it. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all top notch. All right. Our chat is quite pleased, sir. You may continue. All right. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting day. Uh, we really, the, the thing that's kind of blowing my mind and, and we're going to jump right into the weeds, Mark, um, JP Morgan has not rolled their quarterly hedge yet. Yeah, we were just talking about that yesterday on Option Block. They have, have not yeah, come in yet, they huh? The 40, they're short the 4065 calls, 40, at least, I think, 48,000 times. And yesterday they were six bucks and they were about a 37 delta. They're currently an 87 delta and about $23. If, if, they're, if they stick to form and sell a out of the money, uh, the, uh, the 5% out of the money call, they're looking at right around the 4295 call that they'd be looking to sell. That hasn't gone up either. That's pricing itself around um, 59 bucks. So, uh, you know, the there, and that is only about a, call it a 30 Delta. So they've got, you know, there's 40, 48,000 call contracts that, that need to trade that are gonna produce for the market makers, a short delta of uh, about about two hundred fifty thousand. Uh, that is that is no small potatoes in SPX, and yet nothing has happened with this roll yet. Um, I'm I'm thinking that's part of the reason why we melted higher is that the market makers have been buying futures ahead of that, looking to um, you know looking to uh, to trade around it. The other thing I'm watching is. You know, the NASDAQ or the Russell 2000 was really strong this morning. It has since softened. Uh, it's still up one and a half percent leading the other the other indexes. But uh, it has softened up a bit. And um, with the move that we're getting, as much as VIX is kind of getting drubbed, it's really not getting drubbed <laughs> the way you might expect with the, with this rally. So, you know, I'm wondering whether, you know, we're all waiting for this this roll to happen before the market kind of makes it up its mind on what it's going to do with the rest of the day. Uh, definitely off the top, uh, but still plenty of, of potential upside here uh, for the market. So I'm 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 keeping a, a very interested eye on this on on the way we're moving today. Really quickly, we always get new listeners to the show every week, so a lot of them are not going to be familiar with what you're talking about. Give them a quick overview of what the strikes you're talking about and and what the frequency you expect them to roll this is. Yeah, so JP Morgan has a uh, a fund. What is it? Is it J H J H E Q uh J H E Q X? That is the JP Morgan Hedged Equity Fund Class One. Um it I, I don't know if it's a structured product or a fund or whatever. Um, but it is what they do is they trade a they sell a call that is five percent out of the money. And then they've used that to finance a put that I believe is 10% out of the money. And then they sell a put that is, I want to say, 20 or 25% out of the money. I forget the exact uh, thing that they do. And so obviously, their out-of-the-money puts are worthless. They're probably just not going to do anything with let those expire, save the transaction cost. But those calls, normally, they're either 100 delta or zero. Today, they are just absolutely in play. And it's been pretty nutty that that has been uh, that they haven't done anything with it yet today. They didn't do anything with it yesterday. So what they're what they should be doing at some point today is buying back their short four thousand sixty five calls. I believe they're short about forty eight thousand of them, and then going out to j- the June quarterly calls and selling a five percent out of the money, which I believe puts it at forty two ninety five. Uh, but they have not executed that trade yet. Um, so they'll sell that call and then they'll go out and buy a put spread. Um, that put spread will, uh, obviously 
creates some short delta for the market makers uh, as, as well when they do that thing. So maybe not, maybe I overstated the amount of deltas in play, but there are still a lot of deltas in play. Yeah, these types of trades are fascinating to watch. Obviously, you don't usually see them waiting until the very last minute to do these rolls. Listeners, usually it's something you have planned and you, you take off in a much more orderly and earlier fashion than this. Makes it somewhat intriguing. Uh, Kevin, uh, do you watch this big roll out in the S as well? And anything else catching your eye out there today, sir? We do. That is uh, a strike and a product that we're familiar with from the index standpoint. I'd be remiss not to point out that there is a similar product with an ETF tracker that uh, gives you exposure to the NASDAQ 100 with that collar strategy overlaid. JEPQ is the um, NASDAQ ETF ticker. And yes, it's very interesting to see the timing. We uh, are aware of when those rolls go up and at what strikes. Um, and it, it will be kind of fascinating to see whether that 4065 strike acts as a magnet or pushes the market away from it, which it looks like it has to this point today. Um, so that's my kind of not so short answer where it should have just been. Yep. I'm aware. Hamilton Reiner is the, uh, the guy that runs those funds. And before we keep rolling with the vol review, I mentioned we're going to have more baked goods on the show because Mr. Meatball, you and Kevin have a baked goods wager on the line very much in play right now as we speak you were wagering on the performance relative performance of the cues versus the diamonds and i believe your levels mr meatball last week were the cues at 309 and a quarter and the diamonds at 32120 uh, give us an update sir how are we looking on this wager yeah we're right there let me add i'm going to do a uh a comparison chart here and we'll we'll pull this up to 5 days um on the diamonds and you know if we look at let's see what was friday friday was the 24th the 24th so from friday was the 24th so since friday uh friday the uh the dow closed 31089 and the nasdaq closed uh, what the NASDAQ closed? No, the NASDAQ closed 31099. The Dow closed 32232. Um, up until yesterday, uh, the Dow had been outperforming. We'd seen things, but no, the Dow is up approximately. Uh, the Dow is, as we're speaking, is trading 319.12, and or the Qs are. And the Dow is 330.36. So I need uh, a decent, uh, I need a little bit of a sell-off here, Mark, into the close for uh, of the NASDAQ itself to, uh, to pull out ahead. Otherwise, I will be needing to bake my friend <laughs> Kevin a, uh, some, some cakes when I'm in Chicago. How good do your uh, armadillos, then. how good do they hold up to shipping is the question. Well, I, you know, I'm going to be in Chicago the beginning of May with you, uh, and we're going to um, I'll I'll uh, I'm spending that Monday at my parents' house. I will be uh, <laughs> getting out the old box. You'll be of baking and making, <laughs> making Kevin some cakes, some delicious pre-made box cake. You're going to throw in the oven there. Good stuff. Good stuff. So we'll keep an eye on that, listeners. We'll come back. You know, a sell-off in the major indices, the worm turning mid-show, not something that is unforeseeable given the current market environment out there. So we'll keep an eye on that listeners as the show keeps rolling, as we head right on into the vol futures right now. And no surprise out there that they have pretty much come for the vol surface this week. The whole graph has just moved down quite a bit. They've really cut the legs out from under it and the front portion of the curve, even more. So uh, the April future right now down about four points from where it was this time last week, the May future down about three. So just a vol drubbing across the board out here. Kevin, anything catching your eye in the ball surface this week, sir? Yeah, you hinted at it at the kickoff, and you you sort of gave it some structure there with your points about how much the front two months have moved this week. Uh, I will elaborate briefly. The VIX term structure is now at its steepest point. So we're talking about Contango again in calendar year 2023. 
in some situations you see that uh, steepness sort of incent vol sellers that look to capture the potential roll down from uh, month one and month two. We'll see if that if that happens, if that spread continues to widen into expiration. Um, I would also reference something that I brought up during my my run on this show, the move index, which I would argue has been a leading indicator for the past year. The move index, which uh, the inputs there are are uh, treasury option vol thirty days uh, thirty days in the future. And it is back to the same level from early March prior to this, all this Silicon Valley uh, contagion fears. Um, but to put that in a bit of context, early early this month, move index was around 140. That is still historically high. It moved up to just below 200 in mid-March when uh, fear sort of sort of reached its zenith. And it's back down to 140 again. I think um, when we talk about Fed puts, which was sort of a narrative for many, many years, when something breaks, the Fed would be there to support it. You sort of see that argument again in in their approach to stemming the bank run, the contagion fears. I also think that there's sort of an implicit short Fed call because they do not want to see equity markets run away uh, and get ahead of themselves. So does my, my question to the group is sort of like, is the Fed implicitly trading short strangles now where there's some protection <laughs> on the downside and a cap on the upside? I don't know, but uh, it's interesting. And I will certainly keep an eye on this month one, month two spread as we move uh, into April. And we got what two and a half weeks until that thing uh, until the front month comes off. So it, it could be interesting. I like that the Fed strangle, or even like the Fed collar, right? They're collaring everything out there. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting debate because we are seeing uh, many juxtaposing forces out there right now. Of course, without the contagion fears, we would probably see the Fed continuing their more aggressive path. Now, of course, still going a quarter point, but perhaps dialing it back a little bit out there, given. All these concerns out there, people coming out this morning saying most banks are technically near insolvency already. So it is, a, a, like I said, a very contentious issue right now. I'm curious, listeners, do you think the Fed is out there maybe strangling or perhaps collaring the market out there in both directions? I think it's implicitly they kind of are. They kind of have to be. It's an interesting discussion. Mr. Meatball, what do you think on, let's say, the Fed collar out there? And also, what's catching your eye in the vol surface this week, sir? Yeah, you know, I- it, it, I, I had not thought about that, but that makes some sense uh, that, uh, you know, that's very insightful, Kevin. Uh, so maybe that's why, you know, the NASDAQ would outperform so well. Uh, <laughs> it, it's it's definitely insightful. Uh, and uh, in terms of the vol surface itself, uh, we are getting stretched. Um, futures term structure is in a contango. It's about two bucks wide. Uh, with only about 20 days left, that's a little wide. Uh, typically, when you see that spread get this wide, that it tends to tighten up. Um, so things are, I think things feel a little toppy, but the curve itself really steep. Uh, so, you know, if we do get a little pullback, I'm not saying it's going to be like some ridiculously ugly pullback, but maybe just a little bit of profit taking next week is uh, is heading our way. I, I would tend to agree with you there, Mark. And just for compliance sake, this is in no way a recommendation. But I uh, tend to pay attention when that month one, month two spread gets wider than $2. You can see that ahead of expiration, like when you have less than 20 days. You can see it at any point. But when it happens with this much time until expiration, I'm going to pay attention and there are scenarios you can envision where that spread goes from two to a buck wide in a hurry or even less. Um, and so we will be back here a week from now and sort of have that that benchmark of two bucks wide and see what shakes out in the coming week. All right, listeners, let's keep on rolling. See what else is going on out there in the vol market right now. 
Let's go out to the land of VIX, a product you may have heard and know very well out there. VIX actually starting to turn it on a little bit. It was looking a little bit quieter earlier in the session and now looking a little bit more robust. 441,000 contracts on the tape. The ADB, 867,000 contracts out there right now. It's up about 19,000. So that ADB continuing to grow. That ADB continuing to look more robust out there right now. In terms of top positions, let's see how much is open out there in VIX land right now. About 10.5 million contracts. That's nothing to sneeze at out there. And it cost you also 141,000 contracts to break into the top 10 in VIX right now. Also, nothing to sneeze at. So a fair amount of OI open out there right now. By the way, we're still hanging out that level. That just seems to be the level right now in the top 10 right now. Eight calls to two puts. We've been hanging out that way for the better part of the last month. No changing this week. Number 10 is our first of two puts on the list. 141,000 of the April 20 puts. Number nine, a buck 61 of the May 30 calls. Number eight, a buck 62 of the July 60s. Number seven, 178,000 of the April 35s. Number six, our final of two puts here in the top 10, 186,000 of the April 21 puts. So those nice tight April 20 and 21 puts still hanging out in the top 10. Then the rest, all calls, all the time. Listeners, number five, 192,000. Of the April 25s, number four, 234,000 of the May 50s. Our old friend 50 Cent, is that him? If so, when is he going to take these freaking things off? Not yet, obviously. Bad week to take them off this week. Uh, number three, 277,000 of the April 30s. And you know what's holding the top spot, listeners. It's still that 30 40 vertical, 439,000 pretty much of the June 30 40 vertical is open. They put on a couple hundred thousand earlier, and it looks like maybe someone came in to sell a hundred odd thousand. Is that your takeaway as well, Mark? Did they sell that last leg of it? Did someone come in and say, you know, I like this the other way? Yes, that was my interpretation of it. Yeah, that they were they they were they were selling. We definitely saw ball sellers when uh, VIX got juiced. Uh, they were selling call spreads, all kinds of different stuff. So someone listened to our show, found out that we weren't the biggest fans uh, of that way to get long, long-term ball. And they said, you know what? I'm going to take the other side of that because there are, like I said, 439,000 of this spread open, but not all of it the way you might think. So intriguing stuff out there. That's what makes a market at the end of the day. Let's keep on going out to today's paper. First off, let's go to Friday. 441,000 contracts on the tape today, listeners. So like we said, not a bad day so far. Starting to turn up the heat. I expect if we get Mark's anticipated downturn here, then maybe we will see a little bit. Of, it seems like we have plateaued a little bit right now, but who knows? We could keep going back up. Could this be the break before the next respite higher? Or this could be the moment where the worm turns and we end up flat, unched, or even red on the day. In which case, I expect this VIX number to pop even more. Right now, like we said, 441,000 contracts on the tape. The big dog out there, 37,000. Of the April 21 calls, followed by 37,000 as well, the April 25. So perhaps do I smell the vertical out there? Number three, 31,000 of the April 31s. Number four, 25,000 of the June 20 puts. Intriguing. And number five, 20,000 of the April 27 calls. So we're kind of all over the place here with strikes and months in the top five today. Let's go out to yesterday. And yesterday, not a banger day, quite frankly. 522,000 contracts on the tape. Uh, the big day, or I should say the big the big dog yesterday really was 28,000 of the April 25s, followed by 27,000 for number two of the May 30s. Number three, 26,000 of the April 30s. Wow, people playing on that 30 strike there. Listen, is this, is this your opportunity? If you were one of those folks who was piling into 30s before, are you taking this opportunity to maybe uh, reset, add some more, pile into that strike? It's intriguing given how much vol is getting annihilated out there right now. Or are you diving into all these puts to the downside? Hit us up. Let us know. Number four, 23,000 of the May 25s. And rounding out the top five on a fairly anemic day, 18,000 of the May 50s. Our old friend, 50 Cent. Was he taking a little bit off? Just a little trim off the top? <laughs> Probably not, but you never know out there. Wednesday, 614,000 contracts on the tape. The big dog, once again, the April 25s. This is the strike du jour. 55,000 of those, followed by number two, 50,000 of the April 20 puts. Once again, those are on fire. Number three, June 60s, six O's, 30,000 exactly of those going up 
on Wednesday. Number four, 24,000 of the April 22 calls. And rounding out the top five, 23,000 of the April Thursday. It's your Thursday. I'm looking ahead of myself. Of the April, of the April 30 calls. Listen, it's Tuesday. Also, kind of a quiet day. It's interesting that the ADV is up, given the fact that Many of the days this week have not been north of the ADV, listeners. And Tuesday, filling that bill as well, 400,000 contracts exactly on the tape, so less than half of the ADV. Uh, The big dog on Tuesday, such as it was, 43,000 of the April 21 puts, followed by 43,000 as well of the April 19 puts. So a little bit of put vertical action slash roll going on there. Number three, 18,000 of the April 25s. Number four, 13,000 of the April 22s. And rounding out the top five on a... Fairly light day, 12,000 of the May 27s. Interesting strike as well. And kicking off the week, also not the most robust of trading sessions. Monday, 422,000 contracts on the tape. The big dog, 46,000 of the April 50s. So that 50 strike drawn a little bit more attention, but not in May, this time in April. Number two, 36,000 of the June 60s. So we're right back at it to the weirdo upside listeners. Number three, 24,000 of the April 65s. Number four, 14,000 of the July 18 puts. So all over the place on Monday. That's fascinating. And f- number five here, 11,000 of the April 23 puts. So <laughs> an intriguing day on Monday. An intriguing, if somewhat light, volume week, all things considered. Uh, Mr. Meatball, not a hurricane of paper this week. Anything catching your eye out there, sir? Uh, no, the volume was a little lighter this week, but a lot of a lot of put buying. Uh, the big piece was that they came in and just smushed volleyball. VVIX is back down to 83. Uh, the implied vol on vol Q is all the way down to 50. Um, so there is just, uh, you know, they're just coming for the implied vol uh, on these options and and have really taken to to selling uh, to selling premium in, in VIX again. So. Uh, if you're looking for a hedge, it's gotten cheap again. You can get in at uh, great pricing. Kevin, Mark was just talking about the implied vol levels out there on NASDAQ. And maybe, maybe things are getting low. We just talked at the top of the show as well. Vol of vol and VIX as well. They have kind of come for it the last couple of weeks. So what are your thoughts out there on the implied levels we're seeing versus the actual levels of vol to realize in the market, sir? Yeah, let's give that a bit of context. So in in terms of realized and implied levels, which tend to to move together, um, if we're referencing the S&P 500, I look at a 30-day implied. So those at-the-money options that expire in a month trading around 15.9, so below 16 uh, vol. That is just off one-year lows, which below 15 in early April of last year. Now, one month, uh, so trailing realized volatility is just over 17. So we see implied vols trading at a discount to realized, which is somewhat unusual. Um, And you have 10-day realized vol in the S&Ps at 15.6%, all relatively low when you look back one year. Uh, If we shift our attention to the NASDAQ 100, both realized and implied vols are slightly higher, which is par for the course. But 30-day at-the-money implied volatility on the NASDAQ 100 is below 21. That is a 52-week low, and it happens to be the lowest since early January of 2022. Those were old market highs. Um, In fairness, Back then, very early January of 2022, NASDAQ forward vol traded uh, at 17.5%. So there's still some room there. 30-day realized vol in the NASDAQ 100 is running 21%. So again, forward vol is pricing at a discount to trailing realized. those, Those setups give me pause. We've sort of alluded to it a couple different ways here. Um, your your term structure that spread from month one to month two in VIX, uh, I think leaves more room for that to narrow than to widen. That is just my opinion, but it will be very interesting to see when this quarterly roll you know gets gets shifted and whether the market can continue this run. Um, in my opinion, taking a little off the table. 
given the run we've seen in equities, the collapse in vol might make some sense. Again, big old asterisk. That's not advice. That's just my opinion, given uh, somebody that, that watches this stuff day to day. Mr. Meatball, any thoughts on what Kevin's laying down there on the old realized versus implied? Yeah, I mean, realized vol has, you know, when you look at the NDX, right? Um, let me switch in really. And part of, the, you know, realized vol has kind of fallen off a cliff here the last 10 days. So there's there's room for implied to, to continue to drop, um, even though, you know, nat, the vol Q itself is you know getting toward levels that we've not uh not seen that much lately um you know vol q is what it's uh 2180 which sounds low and if you look at a, a stock chart of it that's uh a three month right on a three month low and actually right just above the two-year low but in uh Realized vol for the NDX is way below, um, way below the the current level. I mean, ten day realized vol for the Qs is all the way down at uh, sixteen. So there, there's there's a nice spread spread there. Can we also point out when we're talking about Nasdaq and S and P's and looking back at this quarter, how much the a handful of names that we're all familiar with have uh, skewed performance of the index. <laughs> so yes. concentration is high, whether you're looking at the NASDAQ 100 or whether you're looking at the S&P 500. In fact, uh, Apple and Microsoft now make up like thir- over 13% of the S&P 500 weighting. Yep. That's yes, the highest do. that we've seen in decades back when it was like telephone and, oh man, I forget, uh, IBM. So like late 70s, early 80s. Now that concentration also plays out in the NASDAQ 100. But names like Facebook or Meta, whatever you want to refer to it as, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google, your fangs up like 19% this quarter. The rest of the NAS, I'm sorry, the rest of the S&P 500, 495 names are essentially unchanged on the quarter. So the question becomes, at least from my perspective, do you want and need exposure to the bottom half of an index? Does your portfolio look like that concentrated, uh, uh, those concentrated names that have performed and granted they underperformed last year? Um, again, not something that I can answer, but for listeners, putting that in context and knowing where your returns are coming from can be helpful when you consider ways to offset risk in the future and where you want your exposure to be in the future. Yeah. I mean, the, you're right. The concentration is just insane. And if you've got Qs and NDX and SPX, uh, uh, Qs and SPY together, you're essentially Texas hedge, which means you're, you're, you know, you're not really getting diversification. Uh, if I was going to build a a portfolio, uh, you know, I like owning some NASDAQ, but I I think the diamonds are more diverse, a far more diversified, Despite being only 30 stocks, uh, they actually give you better diversification than either the SPY or the Qs. So if I want high tech, I'm going to buy some Qs. And then if I, for broad market, I'd rather own the diamonds or, uh, you know, I know I've talked about this in the past, RSP, which is the equal weighted S&P. Uh, that gives you, a, um, a, I think, better diversification than owning Qs and SPY together. And if you're holding Apple and Microsoft individually and you're in the Qs and you're in the SPY, you have no idea how concentrated you really are in two, you know, two stocks. Um, it, is, it is just unbelievable. There are, I believe, six stocks in the triple Q. If you group Google and Goog together um, as one stock, make up over 50% of the ETF. I think that last one you mentioned there really hits a lot of the audience. Apple, Microsoft, and then pick your poison, spy, or the Qs are both. Uh, a lot of them fall into that camp and they don't realize you're right exactly how much they have. <laughs> of you all you these are big in techniques. Texas though, yes. Mark. So maybe that oh, is yeah. the way. Yeah. Aren't you legally obligated there, to Texas hedge down there when you're baking your armadillo cakes and, and eating your brisket and all the other. Yeah. They don't, they don't call it Texas hedging here. They just call it hedging. They just call it hedging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just really briefly elaborating on that point, when you look at, cause, cause Mark is talking about sector returns 
And if you look at S&P sector returns over the past three weeks, you do see information technology leading the charge, followed by communication services, uh, utilities, staples, and discretionary. On the downside, probably no surprise, but financials and energy. Um, I, to, to me, the question becomes how much exposure do you want to those sectors? And what do you think that performance will look like going forward? You have some genuine head, head, headwinds in the form of headline risk and your inversion in the, uh, the fixed income term structure. I don't know when that's going to be resolved, but understanding the sector makeup of different indices is really important and can potentially give you a leg up when you look for products and and hedges, whether they be Texas hedged or the old fashioned style that work for you. Let's keep on rolling with our product roundup since we're talking about all things Texas out here. Let's go out to SVIX first. At about a 1670 coming into this part of the show, that puts it up about 2.2 points. Not surprising, SVIX, obviously our inverse friend out there. Uh, doing a little bit of paper today, about 1,200 contracts on the tape right now. The ADB, 1,500. So it's within spitting distance of it. Can it get there today? I guess we'll see. Uh, in terms of top positions, we'll do a quick top three. Number three, 1,000 of the April 8 puts. Number two, 1,058 of the June 11 puts. And the number one position out there in SVIX right now, 1117 of the SEP 35s. We were joking about these last week. <laughs> what would it take to make the SEP 35s even relevant? How low does VIX have to go? How low does that limbo bar have to go? An intriguing prospect. <laughs> I still bring a chuckle to me when I look at those SEP 35s. And then rolling on out to its sibling product out there, UVIX. 1560 right now, getting drubbing. As you would expect, it's a levered product at the end of the day. Down over five, about 5.4 points. So if you're looking for a little UVIX downside this past week, you got it in spades. Looking at numbers out there today, uh, we're actually seeing a little bit of paper out there in UVIX. The ADB also looking uh, pretty decent as well. The ADB is 8,200, so starting to trend in the right direction. It's still not threatening threatening UBXY, but uh, not bad nonetheless. Almost 4,500 contracts on the tape right now, so... Nothing to sneeze at out there. In terms of top three, look really quickly out there as well. Got about a 1,000 of the – these are all expiring today, end of March here, listeners. We've got the 19 half calls for number three. Number two, about a 1,000 as well of the 43 calls. Jeez. <laughs> and the top position in UVIX right now, about 1,300 of the 25 calls. Uh, Mr. Meatball, anything catching your eye out there in the twins, the fraternal twins of SVIX and UVIX, sir? Uh. Yeah, I mean, SVIX is doing what it's it's doing. And, you know, right now when Vol is at 25 or 28, if you're willing to put a leg out uh, and and take a little risk, that's an opportunity to get to get in. It's been very tradable. Uh, I, it, it's probably going to head for a new high. And UVIX, uh, the speed with which that can drop will astound people um, and or should astound people that don't know what they're looking at. I mean, this is this on the, on Friday, it topped out at $24, 24. Last Friday, it topped out at 2440. It's 1570 lost uh, <laughs> $9 in a week. That's a pretty, that's a pretty impressive, impressive uh, sell-off uh, high to high to low. So nice, nice move. This thing can re really rip up and down exhibit a yes that's what it's built for at the end of the day to rip and it did that this week in spades listeners let's keep rolling i want to get some of your questions on the tape as well so we'll, we'll kind of pop through these last ones quickly uvxy at about a four and a half right now down a little over a point about 1.1 points so it seemed like it was going to hang out around that five strike for a while seemed glued and then uh, kind of just broke through it over the last few sessions not surprising uh, the downside impulse and all these vol products has been just overwhelming this week. Uh, about 157,000 contracts on the tape right now. The ADB, 286,000, gaining another 14,000 over the past week. So the ADB growing out here in UVXY. So if UVX wants to catch it, it really needs to get its button here. I can't wait to see what the numbers are when UVXY actually reverse splits. We get an actual real number to trade as opposed to four and a half. But uh, intriguing stuff right now. The top positions... 
we'll do a top three out here as well because we're coming up against it. 23,000 for number three of the April 8s. We talked about those before. Number two, 23,000 as well of the five half calls going out today. And the number one size position in UBXY are the five calls also going out today. 47,000 of those. So uh, those were hanging out. Those were flirting with relevancy just a session or two ago. Now, not so much. If past is prologue, most of those are probably buyers out here on the UBXY front. So like I said it before, I'll say it again. This is a heartbreaking product. The last couple of sessions, last couple of minutes of these products, they will drift away from your strike and leave you just brokenhearted and sad. A VXX, 44 and a half right now, down over six, about six and a half points. So VXX coming back to play a little bit as well. I think you said you put a trade on out there again, Mr. Meatball. You know, this kind of performance, I may have to start looking at. I know I said I washed my hands of it, listeners, but it's it's starting to do what it's supposed to do again. How can you ignore it when it's down almost seven handles on the week? Uh, putting up 29,000 contracts today. The ADV, though, going in the wrong direction. 47,000, down 8,000 from this time last week. So even though VXX is doing what it's supposed to do, fewer people are out there trading it this week, which is kind of, Fascinating. I'll do a quick top three is here as well. Number three, about 20,000 of the April 47 puts. So those are already, already looking pretty good. Number two, 20,000 of the April 40s. And the number one size position in BXX right now, 30,000 of the April 43 puts. What a surprise. All puts all the time out here. Fascinating how that works. Mr. Meeple, anything catching your eye out there in UBXY or your new favorite ball product? I think the one you have tattooed on your forehead now, BXX. Well, I'll say that my short BXX plays worked out pretty well um, with it being this as expensive as it is. There's some meatiness to the movement. Uh, so it, it's really fun to trade right now. Um, UVXY is the opposite of that. It is just boringness. And, you know, <laughs> oh, the, you know, the 30 day vol thing is off 12 percent in a month or in a week. Great. UVXY 12 per, uh, is a down 18% is 80 cents. Way to go. Awesome. Can't wait to trade 80 cents worth of, of premium in, in UVXY. Reverse split, will you? Yeah. Please. Yeah, they need to do it. Uh, but you're right, VXX, as much as I've, I've said damning things about it, it's getting hard. If it can do stuff like this, it's getting a little harder to ignore out there, listeners. As we keep on rolling, you know what else is hard to ignore? It's your questions. Let's get to it right now. A little bit of the old. Volatility voicemail. It's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders. It's time to check the volatility voicemail. Make your voice heard by dialing 779 669 4 VOL. Posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com. Sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com. Or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options. Or facebook.com slash the options insider. All right, everybody, welcome to the Vol voicemail. Let's get right to it. Kevin, I want to jump to this question here from Leon because this touches on what you were just talking about, your favorite product. You've mentioned it a couple of times here on the show over the last few weeks. It's the Move Index. Uh, Leon has a question about that. He says, thank you for producing this program. Well, you're welcome, Leon. He says, I'm a newer listener, and I'm finding it very informative. I learned about the Move Index from this show, and now I'm intrigued. <laughs> it seems hard to find good quotes on this index is it a tradable product? Are there options available? Or is this just a disseminated index for research purposes? Well, Kevin, it sounds like you lured poor Leon to the dark side of the move. You got him all hot and bothered. And now we can't find much about it. But why don't you give our listeners an update on exactly what this move is and what they can do with it? Not poor Leon. Good for you, Leon. When when you learn about uh, measures that that may be meaningful, you you dig and you find out what you can about them. So hats off to you. Uh, I would I would also take this opportunity to point out that no index is tradable. You can't buy or sell the VIX. You can't buy or sell the S and P five hundred. You can't buy or sell the Nasdaq one hundred. You can't buy or sell the Move Index. <laughs> they are measurement tools. But the industry looks to create product designed to track indexes. In this case, the short answer is no, there are, is not product designed to track the move index. Um, is that something that's in the works? Not, not to my knowledge. 
And as far as getting the data, that is a little bit more difficult. You can probably find delayed information. I believe it's an ICE product. Uh, it's been shuffled around ownership there. Was a Bank of America index for years. But when you think about the overall macro environment and the role that interest rates have played in uh, the move for equity markets over the past two years, I think having this on your radar is meaningful. So a couple takeaways there. No index is tradable, but plenty of indexes have products designed to track them. The move index, you can find that data even if it's just end of day, uh, and, and it can help put the, the macro picture in better perspective based on forward interest rate volatility expectations. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for listening, Leon. There you go, yeah, Leon. I, I don't think they even have a tradable future around the move or anything like that. Yeah, there's nothing. Um, you know, they've tried to do different vol, vol futures around bond vol, and they've never really, um, they've never really caught, in, caught in fire. Those guys are sophisticated enough to basically trade that using euro dollars and treasury futures and treasury futures options so they 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 i guess prefer just to to do that to um trading in in the move itself bond market remains more opaque than than most equity markets and perhaps that's intentional but that's the uh, that's the world we currently live that's, in that's that's very nice of you to use the word perhaps mhm mm <laughs> Uh, so, yes, Leon, glad you're intrigued. Sorry you picked up on a product that you can't really sling options on. That's kind of the downside of the move. Has been around for a long time, Kevin is right. I still call it the Merrill Lynch move. That's how old it is, listeners. I'm, I'm a few iterations behind on the naming out there. But it is an intriguing one to keep an eye on. It's certainly something you could have in your arsenal to track, even if you can't really trade it day to day like I know a lot of our listeners want to. Before we get to our paying off all of our bets from this week, uh, Mr. Meatball, you will be very pleased or perhaps disappointed to know that in our epic battle yesterday of day trader versus night trader, which was which was prompted by your madness on the option box yesterday, a day trader <laughs> took it fifty seven point one percent. It was surprise oh, resurgence. Even though I knew some of those overnight futures guys were going to chime in, forty two point nine yeah. percent choosing night trader, and Chris saying night scalping micro futures has been pretty good to him. So we do have so, some night traders in the audience. So to put things in in context for those that don't listen to option box. Um, I, Kevin, you'll like this story. I was interviewing uh, somebody. I'm looking for to maybe potentially hire a day trader. So I got introduced to a guy who said, and I was told, oh, this guy's a day trader. And when I interview him, he's doing some like 30 day iron condor strategy. And so I, I hung up and my wife could clearly tell I was frustrated. And she's like, what, what was that? I said, you know, I'm interviewing for a day trader. And that was not a day trader. That was the opposite of a day trader. And she goes, it was a night trader. <laughs> there we and go. then uh, I I, a rim I shot it. for that. But you, yes, I thought it was hilarious. She 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 was being serious is what was made it so funny because, you know, she doesn't really know the business. That's what makes so, it funny. <laughs> that's what made it hilarious. So, so yes. that's awesome. And I kind of want some Knight Rider theme music behind it the next time you have that conversation. Oh, nice. Oh. I like that. I, see, you're welcome. fitting into the spirit of the network listeners. 80s themed references. I like it, Kevin. All right. All right. As we keep on rolling right on into the crystal ball. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into the crystal ball. All right, everybody. Welcome to the crystal ball, the portion of the show where we get weird, we get wild, and we attempt to wrestle with the ball gods for the coming week. And I very much wish I had a Knight Rider drop on my on my machine right now because i'd be playing it i have that music going in my head right now curse you kevin but i also thank you because it is awesome and as of right now we coming into the end of the show we have vol q like i said everything's getting annihilated vol q at about a 2180 right now vix at about an 18 and three quarters uh, i was looking last week 2375 on vix 2465 on vol q so spoiler alert no joy there uh, looks like the lowest we had was mark this week for VIX, 23.32, obviously, no one even had a teen handle. So no joy on all of that. Uh, before we go around the horn, uh, Mark, I'll let you pick first. And also, if you want to pay off your baked goods wager, sir, now is the time. Yeah, it looks like Kevin won by a hair. So just a hair. 
but guys, uh, we got two hours. Take, take it easy on the payoff. Uh, we there. do. So we'll see where we are at the end of the day. But right now, Kevin's ahead by a hair. Uh, I need a, a pretty nice pullback in the Russell 2000 and, and the Qs. So I need a mega. I need somebody to push the sell button on the mega caps. Uh, I will say that VIX is VIX and VOLQ have been rallying for the last hour and a half. Uh, so maybe, maybe I'll get my payout. We'll see. So I'm going to be for next week. Obviously, we've got non-farm payrolls that I think are going to be interesting. Um, we have uh, a shortened week. Uh, we cl- are closed next Friday. Uh, so we won't actually have a ball queue. Oh, yes. And- actually, go out two weeks. And I forgot we're, we're off next Friday. So go out two weeks. All right. So two weeks from now, here's the way things are going to play out. Uh, I'm going to tell you. Um, next week is going to be a bit of a risk off, uh, or at least on the mega cap side. I think you see mega caps pull back. I think you see some money flow into the banks, uh, because as Kevin mentioned, that move index, that's a good sign that maybe some of the, that we could see the banks move. I'm seeing a ton and I mean a lot of buying of calls of cheap upside calls in banks. Uh, they're blowing up calls in like UBS in Bank of America, in JP Morgan. So I'm seeing uh, some strength in the banks, money coming out of tech. Uh, and then the following week, there, that's when our, our second shoe drops, right after the Easter holiday. Uh, there, there is no joy on uh, that Easter. There's going to be a shoe to drop. And so coming off of a 17 VIX next week, we skyrocket higher and close 2478 in the VIX index and ball Q, uh, which ends up being a safety net, uh, outperforms and closes at 2590. All right, so we're moving away from the palindromic nonsense there. 2478. Okay, I got you. And oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm no, sorry. keep it. Keep it the I'm way you want it to be. Uh, That's fine. I want that. No, 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 2442. I apologize. Okay, I was going to. I was a little and, thrown uh, there, but. <laughs> and 20. And obviously 20, which would be 2552. For, yes. For, <laughs> All for right. Keys. Kevin, wow. I, will, I will go next to allow you time to go last here. And I was feeling a little bit more ball as well, but not quite as much as the meatball out there. I already wrote down my VIX. I'm going to go down a point from where I am this week. I'm going to say 2275. So obviously substantially higher from where we are now, but below my guess for this week. And then VOLQ, the question then is, where does that spread wind up for those two? I'm going to say... 20, it's not quite, it was about, close to a point. I'm going to say a little more than now it's about point and a half. I'm going to say about 24. I'm going to say 24. Let's go 24, 35 for Val Q this time next week or two weeks. I say two, two, two weeks from now. So Kevin, a double whammy. You got to go all the way out two weeks, sir. What do you feel? Okay. So what I'm feeling is uh, awareness of tax day just after two weeks from now. Um, awareness of the potential benefits of 1256 contracts. Your your uh, tax preparer should be aware of that. Um, sorry, just a little plug there for, for the index option business. But looking two weeks out, I, I think it's interesting. And I have always been a fan of the, the potential for spreading volatility products and looking at the relationship between them. So I love how you guys both frame that. I too think that Val has more room on the upside than the downside. So, but I don't quite feel like we're going to see the the move higher that both you guys project. So I'm going to go VIX, 22 quarter, Val Q, 25. So what are we, uh, 275 wide on that spread? 22 quarter, oh, 25 spread, even. Yep. That's pretty yep. wide. Yep. You think you think it's going to widen out again in a couple of weeks? Interesting. Interesting. Yep. All right. Well, there you go, listeners. Uh, there's your market for next week. Get you, I see some of you getting them in already in the live chat. If you're listening after the fact, get them in on you know questions at theoptionsinsider.com or at options on social media. We'll get you added into the rotation. And if you're looking nice and good within our tenth of a point margin of victory in two weeks, remember it's two weeks, listeners, then fabulous prizes will be yours that music means that's going to do it for vol views today it's also going to do it for our on-demand broadcast week all you pro folks hang out we'll be back in a little bit with the oracle of new hampshire himself mr matt amberson from orats to break down the crazy week that was 
from an options oddities perspective. So look forward to that. Should be fun. But before we go, let's go back around the horn. Mr. Kevin, we'll start with you. If folks want to talk to you about anything NASDAQ, or maybe they even have more questions about the move or implied versus realized, where should they go? What should they do? We can be emailed at index options, all one word at NASDAQ.com. We welcome those questions. I'll do my best to get back to you with a thoughtful response or find somebody that can. And, uh, you know, your, your favorite search engine, I think uh, Google has like 90% of that market. And you can find out just about anything about NASDAQ, NASDAQ 100, the constituency, like I talked about, understanding what goes into the index that you're referencing is illuminating. So, so be aware of that. See whether your portfolio stacks up like the NASDAQ 100, or perhaps you should be using those options as a hedging vehicle or alternative index products. Mark, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. There you go. Check them out. It's easy to find. NASDAQ.com is the mothership from whence all that content, all that goodness flows. And Mr. Meatball, where should they go to find all of your ball goodness, sir? Yeah, go to optionpit.com. And uh, I'm writing about all things ball just about every day. Go to, in, in my blog, The VIX Edge. Uh, it co- it doesn't just cover VIX, though. We're, we're trading, uh, discussing S&P. We're discussing Qs. We're discussing VolQ and, of course, VIX. Uh, all the things that you want to know about how to position yourself on a day-to-day and a week-to-week basis, uh, you can find at optionpit.com uh, under the VIX Edge blog. There you go. Listeners, they want a little bit of a culinary blog from you now, too, Mr. Meatballs. How about a little, yeah, ba- a little baked goods do. blog? Maybe put out that meatball recipe. What do you think? Uh, the meatball recipe stays in house, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I can definitely share my my armadillo bake, a baking recipe. I make it from scratch in that I scratch open a box. There we go. That 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 works as scratch. I think for for most of our audience out there. Frank also saying in the live before we go, he likes Kevin's way of looking at VIX and VOLQ. So there you go, Kevin, making converts to the move index, making converts of Frank. Winning over hearts and minds. A few listeners at a time here on the show. My work here is done. Yes, you can, you can go home a happy man for the next two weeks. Unfortunately, like I said, that's going to do it for Ball Views for this week, for the next two weeks, actually. And if you're listening in the pro, stay tuned. We'll be back in a little bit for Options Oddities. If you're not part of the pro yet, what the hell are you waiting for? 200 episodes nearly on that feed right now, exclusive just for you folks. You can listen for over a week of straight. No eating, no bathroom breaks, just a great exclusive pro content. Of course, giveaways, the March trading crates coming up. Get your name in the hat, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. And for all of you out there, we'll have the rest of our content next week. We'll be here on Monday with the option block all the way through to our Thursday offerings. But no show on Friday. Back again in two weeks for another episode of Volatility Views. Stay safe out there, everybody. Volatility Views is brought to you by NASDAQ. From its inception, NASDAQ has been an innovator and agent of change in the financial markets. It's in our DNA. From the development of electronic trading, to our drive to bring enhanced functionality and world-leading technology to our suite of six options exchanges, we exemplify customer focus, consistent technology, and streamlined solutions. Now NASDAQ is proud to launch the NASDAQ 100 Volatility Index, ticker symbol VOLQ to its suite of exchange indexes. VolQ uses only at-the-money options to provide a precise measure of NASDAQ 100 volatility. Learn more about this exciting new volatility product at www.nasdaq.com slash VOLQ. NASDAQ, leading the U.S. options market and continually rewriting tomorrow. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. 
Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. <laughs> 